I don't know if many of you realize how difficult it was to run this clinical trial. Um, you know, I've been involved in many trials over the past 30 years, and this is truly among the most difficult to have first formulated, planned, execute, analyze. Every stage was difficult because we're dealing with, for the most part, some surrogate endpoints without a lot of data to base those surrogate endpoints. We're dealing with elderly patients who are extraordinarily high risk and trying to do serial neurocognitive function studies in patients with a mean age over the age of 80 <laughs> is very difficult. And then doing serial neuroimaging studies is even more difficult. So I'm just telling you, anybody who wants to do a trial like this, good luck, fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> this is a difficult study. So there's one person that you know we haven't spoken about at this meeting so far, and that's Azeem Parsegar, who's the CEO of the company. And she has been an incredible leader, involved to the point that you cannot imagine with every detail. And I think it's her spirit and her perseverance that it's, that's allowed us to get to the point where, where we can make some sensible conclusions from this study. So I'm very proud to have been associated with the Sentinel trial. I'm extremely proud of the three co-PIs, um, Axel, Sushil, and Samir, who did a spectacular job, and all of the core laboratories who were directly involved in trying to analyze this difficult study. I'm not going to mention the device because you obviously know what we're talking about. And I'm not even going to talk about the study because it's been reviewed now very carefully. Um, it's a three-arm study meant to show safety. That's the obligatory safety, but it's not just uh, a meaningless obligatory number. If we're going to use this device, we have to be confident that it's safe. But the one thing that we were never sure about was, in a trial with this level of rigor, can we ascertain safety? And I think that I feel very confident, having watched my colleagues work and seen all the data, that this is a safe device. And I think that's extremely important, one of the take-home messages. But I'm going to finish this presentation with five messages. The first is that um, dual filter cerebral protection now has been systematically evaluated, not just in one, but in numerous clinical studies, including now three randomized clinical trials, and actually shown you with consistent results, now in over 750 patients after TABR. These are just some of the manuscripts relating to the work that's been done thus far with this particular system. So there's a density of clinical evidence that should be respected. So that's an important take home message. It's not just a single abstract study, it's now three randomized trials with consistent outcomes. The second message is I've begun to suggest this device is safe um, and the safety is important. It does take a little time, it takes some getting used to. Some people will do it in two minutes, some people will take five minutes. It will add some procedural time, but it doesn't really um, stress resources and I think patient safety was really not an important issue. So it's compatible with standard cath lab workflow. <laughs> 99% of the patients got one filter, 94% got both filters that were successfully deployed. There was only a single patient with an access site complication. Um, only 1% of devices interacted with other devices. By the way, that's not trivial. Many devices that you will hear about are sitting in the aorta and the interaction with balloons, wires, and other devices is significant. This sits at the roof of the aorta and literally is, it, it's, it, you have to work to try to interact uh, any of the other equipment with this device. So that's an important consideration. And over 90% of the devices were deployed in less than 10 minutes. You've seen the safety endpoint, which clearly met the non-inferiority and the superiority performance goals, so I'm not gonna belabor that. The third message is that the Sentinel device successfully captures and removes debris in 99% of patients. So whether or not you feel that the neuroimaging data is substantial enough or the clinical outcomes are substantial enough, this is in, incontrovertible. That there will be debris going to the brain in 99% of the patients, and it's not a trivial amount of debris, and it doesn't matter what valve you use or what system you use, it happens with every valve, and when you see some of the patients that have very substantial debris from the standpoint of number and size, it's hard not to imagine that there would be at some point consequences that would affect ultimate either neurocognitive function or over neurologic events. It's hard to predict, but there's no question about this, that there's debris everywhere. And it's not just thrombus. It is arterial wall, it is valve material, it's calcium, it's a whole variety of things that are clearly associated with the procedure itself. 
fourth message is that we've been conditioned to thinking that strokes are now irrelevant because we've gotten so good. Well, you've seen that in the baseline population that 9% of patients had strokes. These are some of the best operators in the world. I will challenge anybody to say that these are not some of the best operators in the world. When you do oversight with neurologic screening of these patients serially, you're going to still find strokes. Now, admittedly, the majority of these were not large disabling strokes, but these were neurologic events that were clearly evident to a neurologist, and they occurred in almost 1 in 10 patients in the modern era with very, very high volume expert operators. So I will say that strokes are not as much of an issue as they were in the past, but it is the most feared complication of this procedure. The majority of these strokes are periprocedural. The Sentinel device, and we didn't emphasize this in the original presentation, eliminated all of the periprocedural strokes, depending upon what you define as periprocedural. Overall, the Sentinel reduced the frequency of 30-day strokes from 9.1 to 5.6%. Now, that was not significant, but it was close to a 40% reduction in overt clinical events, and this study was never powered to show clinical endpoint differences. <coughs> It also reduced the severity of the 30-day strokes, something that Sushil tried to emphasize in the presentation that I hope people will understand. So here, just looking um, uh, at the strokes in the first 24 and 48 hours, you can see in the Sentinel group, there were no strokes until between 48 and 72 hours, whereas you can see in the control arm that there were seven strokes that were before 72 hours. So there's no question that there was an exaggerated or an enhanced, and Raj Makar made this point, periprocedural effect of the Sentinel device. Now, all, not all of these strokes are related to the procedure themselves. So the stroke frequency, as I mentioned, was reduced by 38%. And Sushil also mentioned that if you look at the severity of the stroke, so the change in modified ranking score from baseline to 30 days, that there was more of a change in the Sentinel group. Um, uh, um, the delta was much less in the Sentinel group, suggesting that stroke severity was much less. So even if it didn't eliminate the stroke, the effect of the stroke based upon 30-day modified ranking scores compared to baseline was substantially less. And the final message is that I think there is consistent serial DWMR imaging before and after TABR demonstrating what is clearly a reduction in new lesion volume and number with Sentinel. The baseline lesion burden flare was a strong predictor of new lesion volume and number after TABR. The choice of TABR valve system was also a predictor of new lesion volume and number. Now there are a lot of confounders here and I think that a Axel did a good job describing those. Because with a device, there's also a procedure. Sometimes you might pre-dilate and post-dilate. There are many different things that are associated with it. And we didn't stratify according to valve type, so you need to consider that. But there were some valve-related differences, clearly. But if you adjust for these covariates, now it's a post hoc adjustment, but we couldn't have known this going into the study, Sentinel did significantly reduce new lesion volume and number in both protected and all brain territories, and that's shown in this slide. Looking at the primary efficacy endpoint, looking at neuroimaging changes with new lesion volume and after adjustment, and looking at the same endpoint but new lesion number uh, initially uh, and after adjustment for these two covariates. So from my perspective, there's no question that there is an effect you can argue the magnitude of the effect, um, but I'm confident that the effect is real and it's been consistent. So finally, this trial really was a landmark clinical study, difficult to execute, challenging to analyze, as many of the outcome measures were both non-definitive and underpowered. Nevertheless, the results can be summarized very easily in a single sentence. Sentinel was successfully deployed in most patients, was safe without adverse clinical events, retrieved debris in essentially all patients, and reduced both clinical neurologic events and neuroimaging evidence of brain embolization. There are still many questions that will require further investigation, uh, including the association of valve type with clinical and neuroimaging outcomes, the optimal methodology and correct interpretation of the neurocognitive function studies. I was really interested to listen to, to, to the discussions of this. Um, because we need to do this better because right, if we had to do it differently, I'm sure 
knowing what we know now, we would have done it differently. I think the revised use of neuroimaging endpoints or other composite endpoints in future Long clinical trials Long needs to be addressed. And then recommendations for selective or systematic use of Sentinel based upon perhaps some subset analyses. But sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, and you've got to decide what brain you want. One with Sentinel or one without Sentinel, and this is a very carefully constructed um, analysis of the perfusion abnormalities that, that I think clarify um, some of the uh, concerns that we have and essentially summarize what we think um, are, are the results of an important clinical trial. Thank you.